Okay, Dr. Elizabeth, um, I think we should begin because uh, all the participants are here and the ones who were supposed to join through Zoom are also with us. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I'm going to hand over the mic to uh, the Chairperson Mass Communication Department, Ms. Rachel Hassan. Thank you, Sakeb. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to FCCU. Thank you for joining us today in our Climate Journalism Education Workshop. There are a lot of you that I see here who've been with us in our previous trainings and previous workshops. Thank you for coming again and welcome to all the new participants and we hope to see you all in future in our future activities as well. Uh, this is yet again a very nice and a beautiful blend of participants, institutional participants, because uh, we don't just have participants from Pakistan or from Lahore only, but we have international participation as well. So this is just amazing. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Tafullah Khan, Dean of Humanities, for his introductory note, and he'll be talking to us about the workshop. Thank, uh, thank you, sir. thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Sakib. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, those who are uh, online, this is really wonderful to see everybody. And I'm really thankful to all the participants <laughs> and speakers uh, to become part of it. Uh, it's really an honor for us to host this activity. Uh, like uh, climate is crisis is real. Like the first and foremost thing is that there are a lot of denials, uh, including the most powerful countries in the world who, who are not ready to sign, uh, accept it and regulate themselves. But uh, for us, it's very important since the, I think this is the first initiative to talk about climate journalism education. Uh, in, for the Pakistani media, I think it's very important that we, we understand the connection between science and, and journalism. Uh, it's, uh, and also because most of our journalism remained kind of statement based, like statement focused. It's about politics. And we can also see that being a crisis zone, Pakistan also dealt with a lot of conflict sensitive journalism and stuff like that. Uh, but then there are everyday realities about which we are at times handicapped to uh, discuss them, to report them, and to really give them proper space in the media. So for that very reason, it's very important that we start at the journalism education institutions because uh, this is something for the present and the future. Uh, so if we have uh, an, a good understanding amongst the young uh, students of ours, of what climate uh, crisis is, but how can climate journalism help, and what are our responsibilities and roles as citizens, as professionals, it will help a lot. It's not for the future, it's for the present. Uh, and it's also kind of a sensitization effort for the media that they understand that there is a crisis and we need to report it because at times climate crisis is considered to be uh, one that is not too important. Uh, and uh, rightly so, sometimes people say we don't have any, enough to eat, there are, there are no health facilities available and stuff like that. But we see that many of these problems are connected kind of globally and we understand science knows, explains that. And I'm also really thankful for uh, our Dr. Derek for, to be here. And uh, I'm really happy that we are hoing, uh, now hosting a multidisciplinary activity at FCCU. This, was, this is one of the most important aspects of knowledge creation at universities. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here. And I look forward to learn a lot from this discussion. OK, um, wonderful. Um, Michael, Michael, Michael. OK, so hi, everyone. I know we said hi a bit earlier, but it's really nice to be here and be part of this workshop. Um, as mentioned, my name is Hannah Bernstein, and I work with the Internews Earth Journalism Network. Um, and uh, we do a lot of different things. I'm gonna be talking about what we do and also how you can use the resources um, and the events that we have to um, include in your curriculum and to build um, resource material for students in your classes about climate journalism and a lot of other environmental journalism topics. So just to get started with a little bit about EJN, I think there are uh, a couple people in the room who uh, are familiar with us already, which is great, but basically we are a grant funder and we're also a journalism network. 
Um, and our primary goal is to increase the quality and quantity of environmental media worldwide. We do that in a lot of ways. Um, one of the big ones is by providing a variety of different resources. Um, these are just some highlights. Uh, we've been around since 2004. Um, so these are just some things we've been up to since then. We also have, as our journalism network, we have more than 15,000 journalists in that network. We've trained more than 12,500 journalists since we began working in 2004. We host webinars and we produce e-learning courses and we also send journalists around the world to various United Nations conferences and other important events. So that's just a quick overview. And like I mentioned, we are a project of Internews, which is a global media development organization. And Internews works on a lot of different topics, not just the environment. And so EJN is sort of Internews' environment hub. We kind of do all of the environment and climate work for the organization, but Internews on a wider scale works on human rights, democracy, press freedom, health. You know, COVID-19 journalism has been a big part of what the organization as a whole has been working on lately. Um, and we're really interested also in sort of fostering synergy between all of these different topics since, you know, climate change really does affect every other aspect of our lives. So this is just a quick map of where we are in the world. Um, I'm based in the U.S. in Florida, but we have offices all over the world. These are the orange dots are our headquarter offices. And you can see that we've had pr programs pretty much everywhere, either in the past or currently. So we are a global organization. Um, and we have supported quite a few journalists. Uh, South Asia is one of EJN's hubs as well. We have several grantees and partners in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh. So um, this is a region of the world that we are uh, working heavily in. And that's a little bit about me, but since I can't physically be there with you and I've never met you, I wanted to know a little bit more from you about what you're interested in. Um, so I have two quick interactive questions for you. There are instructions at the top of the screen of how to get to this. You can use a computer, you can use a phone. If it's not working for anyone, feel free to also put your, your answers in the chat, that's also fine. Um, and I would really love to know, you know, what are the topics that you are most interested in um, that you'd like to bring to your classroom or that you'd like to learn about yourself? Um, I'm really curious what kind of topics are on your mind that seem important. Um, so basically you go to menti.com and you enter that uh, eight digit code at the top of the screen. If it's not working, please let me know and I'll just give everyone a few minutes to kind of take smog. I see multiple people are saying smog, uh, global warming, deforestation, heat waves, floods, rising temperatures. I'm seeing some common themes, which is, which is cool. These are all really important issues. Um, and heat waves, associated diseases. Yeah, the health impacts, that's something we're working on at Internews right now, which um, actually another panelist here also from Internews is um, specifically working on that. Um, Stella Paul is presenting later. Water scarcity, water shortage. Yep, forest fires, rising sea levels. These are all so good. Thank you all for submitting. This is so many. Oops. Didn't mean to do that. Sea walls. Okay. I wanted to hear from all of you on this because EJN works on a wide variety of topics. So I was curious if there are specific resources that maybe we don't have yet that we should. Um, so I definitely see a few here that, you know, this feedback is helpful. Um, and also many of these we currently have resources on that you can use in your classrooms. So I will get into that in a minute. I'll just give it like one more minute for anyone else that wants to submit. Earthquakes, hmm. pollution, seawater filtration for drinking purposes. That is a really good one. Controversial, expensive, but potentially necessary. Okay, I have one more question for you. So it'll be the same process, but a different eight digit code. So I'm gonna click next and you'll see the new code, but still menti.com. Um, and these answers will all be saved. So I'm, you can have the presentation 
and um, you'll be able to see all of the answers in case you're interested later. Okay, so I would really like to know, based on that first question, what are the barriers? What is preventing you from including these topics in your classes? Is it, you know, you don't feel like you have enough information to teach it? Do you not have resources you have access to? Is it just time? There's not enough time in, you know, a semester. Um, I'm kind of curious, what are the barriers that you might be facing? Um, and again, this is Menti, again, same system, just different um, code. So the new code is at the top of the screen. Ah, good, already coming in. You all have to go to the menti.com again using the new password and answer this mm -hmm. question. What are the barriers? Why do you feel you face to uh, teaching or learning these topics? Course structure. Lack of resources, the subjects are not offered in our roadmap. Hmm. <clears throat> Science and journalism connection, that's a good one. Lack of interest, Pakistani journalism is full of political drama. Mm, very similar here in the US, I will say. Lack of interest, student interest, yeah, that's a big one. No proper course outline or content. Lack of basic knowledge among students. Interesting. Climate change journalism is not offered as a separate subject. Ah, yes. Lack of awareness. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of similar lack of awareness or basic knowledge about the topic which you know translates to a lack of interest if people don't understand what the importance is or the, the 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 basics it's hard to be interested how to create an appetite for science journalism the million dollar question cool in the interest of time because i want to make sure i get through things and then let other panelists take over i'm going to move on um but i really love these responses thank you all for trying mentee with me um these are really, really interesting, and it's really good to know a little bit more about you um, and how EJN can better help professors and educators in this um, arena. So I'm going to move on. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about is what resources we have available and how they can be part of your course materials, whether that's something you maybe show in class, use for your own knowledge, or assign as homework, uh, as research assignments, things like that. Um, and just a note that all of our resources are free and they're open to the public. They are available to anyone. Um, they are primarily in English, although this is a major priority of ours is to offer them in additional languages. Um, and to start, I wanted to start with our online courses. So this is just a sampling um, and the link to our website where you can find all of our courses uh, is at the top of the page here. Um, some of these are developed by EJN directly, others are developed by Internews more widely, but we have online courses. These are self-paced, they're free, um, and they are uh, completely online. It's a mix of videos and text, um, quizzes, exercises. Um, and while these are really good resources for journalists and students wanting to learn more about a particular topic, they can also help with that issue of course structure, finding out how to introduce the topic, how to dive into it, um, these courses were developed by experienced people who have been teachers. Um, and so these can be a really good resource to kind of start that train, start moving, start developing some curriculum, especially if you don't feel like you have that roadmap. Um, so these are just some of the ones that we have available. Um, and we have more coming out later this year and into the future. Our big one that we just released is this From Microbes to Rainforest, an introductory biodiversity course for journalists. This starts at the very basics of biodiversity science, why it's being threatened, um, the climate link, um, and why climate change is threatening the world's biodiversity, and then how to actually discuss it and talk about it. Um, so that's uh, a really big uh, course that we launched recently. We also have several courses about COVID-19, misinformation and reporting, vaccine, mis and disinformation. 
We also have several data journalism tutorials that walk you through how to cover something using data. So these can be a really great resource. We also have webinars. Um, these are live events, but we also record them. And then the, all the recordings are available. We have 60 plus webinars to browse through right now. And we have one to two every month. Um, and they are on a huge variety of topics. I mean, you can see here, these are just a couple. Um, and they're, like I said, there are 60 more. Um, so we have done a lot of work on various climate change um, issues. Um, and these webinars often feature important experts from different parts of the world. Um, and they're a really great way. Maybe it's something you show in your classroom. Maybe it's something you assign to students as background information. This is also a really good way to find experts. Maybe you want to bring a guest speaker to your classroom um, or you're interested in a particular scientist's work. Um, and this is a good way to find people working on specific topics. So, um, those are our webinars. And again, the link is at the top if you'd like to browse all of them. And then we also have written tip sheets and guides. These are three of our most recent. Um, we've just published a guide for journalists looking to cover climate and environmental conferences like COP27 coming up in Egypt. Um, and that is tips for journalists from journalists. Um, so that's our most recent one. We also have a new series, an introduction to data journalism. So part one was just released and it will be continuing into the foreseeable future. This really starts at the beginning and talks about using data, climate data for journalism. And then we also, uh, our other newest one is about zoonotic diseases and how climate change is making disease spread different and more likely. So those are three of our most recent ones, um, but there are many, many more on every topic imaginable. And our page here slash resources is sortable by topic. So you can zero in on exactly what you're looking for. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that we are really available for networking purposes. Um, something that when I was in school, my professors would assign me was something called informational interviewing, where if somebody was, this may be something you're already familiar with, but um, if somebody, if I, the assignment was to find someone in a job role, a journalist or maybe someone at an NGO or whatever job you kind of envision for yourself and asking them for a short 15 to 30 minute interview about how they got there. Um, and it was designed to sort of be help people think about what career they'd want and where they want to go after school. I found it really helpful. Um, and I do these um, for if people are interested, they want to work for a grant funder or a journalism network like where I work. And my colleagues also do them. And so this is something that we can help with if students are interested in doing this kind of thing, exploring different career paths. We know a lot of people. And so we're really happy to make those connections for you and help connect people. Um, we can also provide sources or experts that are needed for class assignments. Like I said, if there's a webinar speaker that a student really wants to get in touch with, we can connect them if they reach out to us. We can also help connect you with guest speakers for your classes if there's certain people you're interested in bringing. You know, in, in this new age of Zoom, it's very nice to be able to bring guest speakers that may not live near you. Um, and so if there's particular people that we're connected with that you would like to bring to your classes, we would love to be a bridge. Um, and we can also, you know, there's a lot of organizations like us, a lot of nonprofit, NGO, journalism organizations. Um, and if there's other connections that we can make that would be helpful for your classes, we would love to do that. Um, we are a network. And what that means to us is that we have to engage with our network. We are not just you know, an NGO operating ourselves. We really want to be in touch with the people that benefit from our program. Um, and so my direct email is on the first slide. And then we also have a general email that's on the last slide of this PowerPoint. Um, and I would really love to hear from any of you if there's any connections I can make, um, because I, I really think that's part of our mission. So that's that. And then really quickly, I also wanted to run through the other aspect of what we do, which is funding opportunities. Um, these are targeted more at professional journalists or students trying to get a foothold once they graduate. Um, but some of our opportunities are certainly open to students um, if they pitch us well. Um, we will essentially accept any good pitch, no matter who it's from. So uh, we do not you know, only award more experienced journalists. This can be a really good opportunity for students to get 
articles published. Um, so we have a lot of different funding opportunities. Our primary one is story grants. So we provide funding to individual journalists or small teams um, to produce. We will offset travel costs. We'll pay for COVID tests, especially right now, lodging, food, um, also a stipend for the journalists themselves. We'll pay for maybe a photographer or any other people they wanna bring along. Um, and they'll pitch us the story and they'll work one-on-one -on -one with a mentor to see that story to the finish line. Um, these are just a couple of the ones that we've had, but we have new ones essentially every month. Um, in particular, the last one on the screen, the Asia Pacific Story Grants, those are open right now and they don't close for a couple more days until June 6th. So if any of your students or you are interested, that one is open for applications right now and we would love to support you. I'll, I'll have a link at the end of the slide. The other funding opportunity that we have that I think is really beneficial for helping students understand why this is important and kind of give them a cool incentive um, is our fellowships. So our fellowships are basically funding to attend conferences like we were at COP26 in Glasgow, we will be at COP27 in Egypt. We bring roughly 20 journalists to every single COP and have been doing that since 2007. Um, we're also at other COPs, not just the climate COP. We were just at the UNCCD desertification COP scene just this past uh, May. And we do a couple things. We do virtual fellowships. We do physical fellowships to actually take you there. We also do daily broadcasts and briefings that are open to the public. So if you're not able to be at the conference, you can still report with our Zoom, our Zoom calls that feature experts, delegates, high-ranking officials. Um, these are a good opportunity for where you can go with climate journalism. These conferences are, have always been important, but are getting increasingly more important um, as the effects of climate change become more pronounced and making sure that journalists, especially young journalists are there is one of our major goals. So we will be announcing the call for applications for COP27 in Egypt, um, honestly, probably in the next week and a half. So that will be open soon. I don't have a link yet for you, but that is another really good opportunity. And then we also host workshops. We're looking to host more of these. We kind of recently returned to in-person workshops since the pandemic. These are just a couple we've had recently. Um, and these are sort of smaller intimate settings as opposed to a fellowship, which is quite large and chaotic. Um, these often involve field trips to local communities, um, engagements with government officials, other journalists. They're a really great opportunity for journalists to meet each other. Um, and typically they're focused on a particular topic, air pollution, renewable energy. Uh, and these are a really great way to build community and also skill building. And uh, I'll just end with some upcoming items. So like I mentioned, story grants for journalists in the Asia Pacific region um, are due June 6th. Um, this is uh, a fairly open call. We're not focused on any particular topic, but we are interested in underreported stories, ones that are kind of cross-sectoral, explore the ways climate change and environmental issues intersect with each other. And like I said, those are due June 6th, and this is linked. So it's on our website, but that is a direct link. And then, like I mentioned, applications for our 2022 Climate Change Media Partnership Fellowship, which is our fellowship to the UNFCCC COP. This is for COP27. It will be launching in early June, as early as the end of this week, potentially early next week. Um, and that is typically going to be open for a month for applications. Um, and then we also have a new e-learning course in the pipeline. It's focused on renewable energy, particularly in India, the landscape, the challenges, opportunities. That's gonna launch in July or August, which is really exciting. Um, and we're hoping if it does well to expand that into the rest of Asia. And then every month we're posting new grants, new tip sheets, we're holding new webinars, new training opportunities. And you can always check those out on our website. Um, and we also have a listserv. So I've also linked our listservs there. It's a really great way to connect with other journalists, other media trainers, teachers, educators of all kinds um, on those. And again, all of this is free, open to access for anyone. Um, and that's EJN and I'm really happy to present it all to you. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to let me know. All of our information for Internews and EJN, you know, website, email address, Twitter, all of that is there at the bottom of the screen. And um, yes, thank you for this opportunity to share this with you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much for sharing this very valuable information. Uh,
I'm sure it's going to be of great help to all the participants here who would want to either teach in climate journalism or who intend to include it in their curriculum. It's going to be of great help because the resources that you have mentioned are going to be very beneficial for them all. Thank you so much. And now I would like to invite Mr. Mohammad Abu Bakr, who's the climate communications professional with 10 years of experience in environmental journalism and advocacy, storytelling and awareness raising. His bylines have been published in the third poll, Reuters, Dawn, and the News International, among other dailies. He is currently affiliated with the International Water Management Institute, Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Derek Baker, uh, Ms. Rachel Abu Hassan, Sakib Saab, uh, and uh, other colleagues, the distinguished journalism faculty from Lahore and around the world, and uh, journalism students. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at this climate change education workshop. I'm Sayyid Muhammad Abu Bakr, I'm an international award-winning journalist, but uh, I actually began my journey from here. I did my intermediate in the six and eight. Here I'm doing Nashtag Kapli and enjoying the friends. I had a really good time at FC College. So here, uh, before we, uh, before I come up and share my perspective, I'll come up with the views of some of the top academians around the world on what they have to say on climate journalism. So, बहुत शुक्रिया अबू बकर आपने मुझे अपनी प्रेजेंटेशन का हिस्सा बनाया आई एम मोस्ट ग्रेटफुल टू बी हेयर आई एम स्पेशली ग्रेटफुल और बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया कि मैं जो हूँ फॉरमन क्रिश्चन कॉलेज एफ सी कॉलेज में हूँ एफ सी कॉलेज जो है वो पाकिस्तान का एक बहुत अहम अदारा है नाई विश आई वॉज देयर विद यू इन पर्सन आपने जो सवाल पूछा इन्वायरमेंट क्लाइमेट के बारे में उसके लिए मेरे ख्याल में पहले ये करते हैं जरा बाहर निकलते हैं और सवाल पर सोचते हैं सवाल ये है कि हमें क्लाइमेट के बारे में रिपोर्टिंग करते हुए जर्नलिज्म करते हुए कैसे सोचना चाहिए मेरे ख्याल में इसका जवाब वही है जैसे हमें इस टॉपिक पे या किसी भी टॉपिक पे एज अ स्कॉलर एज अ रिसर्चर सोचना चाहिए कुछ फर्क है लेकिन बेसिक रूल्स वही है बेसिक रूल मेरे ख्याल में तीन है पहला यह है कि स्टिक टू द फैक्ट्स मैं चाहे रिसर्चर हूँ या खसूस मैं जर्नलिस्ट हूं मैं एक्टिविस्ट मेरा काम एक्टिविस्ट होना नहीं है मैं इंडिविजुअली एक्टिविस्ट हो सकता हूं लेकिन एज अ जर्नलिस्ट मेरा काम जो है वो फैक्ट्स को रिपोर्ट करना है मेरा फैक्ट्स काम जो है वो ओपिनियन बनाना नहीं है किसी नारा लगाना नहीं है किसी एक साइड पे होने का नहीं है मेरा काम ये नहीं है कि मैं लोगों को कन्विंस करूँ कि क्लाइमेट बड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट है मेरा काम ये है कि मैं बताऊँ कि क्लाइमेट है क्या और अगर मैं अपने फैक्ट सही बताऊँगा तो उसकी इंपॉर्टेंस खुद आ जाएगी और मेरी क्रेडिबिलिटी बढ़ जाएगी दूसरा यह है कि आस्क क्वेश्चन आस्क टफ क्वेश्चन अब मेरा काम जवाब देना नहीं है मेरा काम ये है कि मैं वो सवाल पूछूं जिससे मेरे पढ़ने वाला जो है वो सही जवाब तक पहुंच सके मैं एक्सपर्ट से वो सवाल पूछूं मैं लोगों से वो सवाल पूछूं जिससे क्लैरिटी आए और अगर मेरे सवाल अच्छे होंगे तो जवाब खुद अच्छा आ जाएगा अगर मैं जवाब के पर फोकस करूंगा तो फिर मेरा वही प्रॉब्लम हो जाएगा नारा मारने वाला और उसकी वजह से मेरी और मेरी स्टोरी की क्रेडिबिलिटी जो है वो कम हो जाएगी और आखिरी चीज जो है जो बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है वो है कि कीप इट सिंपल इन वे कीप इट सिंपल का मतलब यहां ये है कि मेरा मकसद जो है चीज को क्लियर करना है उसको कॉम्प्लिकेट करना नहीं है ये शो मारना नहीं है कि मेरे पास बड़े बड़े लफ्ज आते हैं मुझे बड़े बड़े कॉन्सेप्ट समझ आते हैं मेरा काम ये है कि जिनको कॉन्सेप्ट नहीं समझ आते उन्हें आम जबान में मैं कन्वे कर सकूं वो सवाल पूछूं जो एक आम शख्स के जहन में है खसूस एक स्केप्टिकल शख्स के जहन में और उसको उस सिंप्लिसिटी से बताऊं ताकि वो समझ सके कि इसका जवाब क्या है That I think is the mission. बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया बहुत शुक्रिया जी आप सबका सुनने के लिए मूव टू दैक्स लाइफ सो हेयर इज दर्स्पेक्टिव ऑफ मैट स्वेन इज ए कोर्स डायरेक्टर ऑफ इंटरनेशनल जर्नलिज्म कार्डिफ यूनिवर्सिटी आई इज मई मेंटर इन टू थाउजेंड एटीन Journalistic work. Let it be printed on your phone, put there, and we have to report on environmental change impacts on how it's impacting the lives of communities. By having the, the those people who are getting impacted from climate change, we are actually bringing those issues into limelight, and that helps to gain traction. And we also need to share the positive things that are coming up. Uh, maybe some initiatives that are helping to deal with climate change, such as the 10 billion tree tsunami. initiative or the the last government's initiative to increase more national parks so that's a move that can help adapt and mitigate climate change so uh, you know such initiatives such uh, active you know, interventions they help to get good traction 
next next so uh, this is leo hickman he is the director of carbon beef carbon beef is a website digital website uh, based in the uk that comes up with expert policy advice on various interventions on activities maybe on uh, renewable energy maybe on decarbonization so what uh, he says is that uh, climate change is not just uh, an environmental uh, subject it's a science agriculture business uh, fashion uh, all sort of sorts of stories climate change is actually cross cutting why it is cross cutting because uh, i'll quote a report it's a wfs microeconometric study what they said was that assuming a 0.5 degree celsius rise in temperature will experience crop losses uh, over 2 to 250 dollars per hectare per year so climate change now is impacting agriculture according to one report so it means that it's you know it's cross cutting affecting every field <coughs> To be a good, a good climate journalist, you need to be a good data journalist. So you know, if you are able to go through all those lengthy reports of the IPCC of of UNFCCC, and you are able to find out the right fact, you'll be able to have a story that will get amazing traction. For instance, there was an FAO report that said Pakistan had 1.9 percent forest cover before uh, the launch of a billion tree tsunami in KP. So the deal was that you know that information 1.9 Was at some hundredth page in the table, Pakistan, and you know you need to figure it out, and then you need to recheck with some expert that whether this information is correct and should it write it that way. And once you have you have quoted it rightly, then you will be able to produce a good success story. We move we move next. So this is by uh, Andy Williams. He is a senior lecturer at the School of Journalism. We talk about science journalism. So you know what he says, and he has extensive research on the subject that. uh you know we have to tell how fossil fuel industry is confusing the public on the reality of climate change so what the fossil fuel industry does is that it is it is funding climate skeptics to tell that climate change and global warming is not real and uh, this is the same tactic that the tobacco companies they use to confuse the public that you know uh, tobacco smoking is not, is not harmful and uh, Uh, he has a good advice that it's important to be transdisciplinary in approach and introduce students to evidence from academic histories of public relations, critical studies of public relations, propaganda studies, journalism studies, and media sociology <coughs> and climate change views, as well as critical investigative journalism. And he also says that uh, journalism students should critically evaluate uh, of the news as well, and they should assess whether this news is investigative. Is whether uh, this news is balanced or is there some PR-funded news? So by you know reading it by going through it thoroughly, they'll be able to figure out. This is by uh, this is Wolfgang Blau. He's the co-founder of Oxford Climate Journalism Network at the University of Oxford. One of the most talented guys you may find on Twitter who's talking about climate journalism. You can, or if you find you know just uh, Google his name, Wolfgang Blau, Blau. You'll find his Twitter account. So what he says that in the context of Pakistan, our cases of adaptation because our emissions are less than one point one percent in the global carbon trajectory, but we are among the top ten countries most vulnerable to climate change. So we have to focus on adaptation. So our journalistic work and if we are you know uh, teaching students on what to focus on, so the students should be focusing on adaptation, adaptation to climate change. For instance, there is more heating, so you know you need you need to have more shade. Or maybe have more water to avoid heat <coughs> wave or sunstroke. And he says that you know you need to access reports by the IPCC and the other organizations. And uh, unfortunately, in Pakistan, many organizations they don't have sort of climate desks. So our colleagues over here as well know that anyone who covers environment covers fashion, covers health, covers everything, covers five to six beats. So anyone who is doing climate journalism is actually out of his or her own passion. Because there is no opportunity, there is uh, no good funding. If you know, if you want to go to Shishpur Glacier in Hunza and you ask uh, your editor to cover your expenses, it's going to cost you over a hundred thousand rupees. And uh, you know, the editors are not willing to invest in such ventures. And uh, he also suggests that media organizations they need to survey their audiences on their current know-how of climate change. So you know this man, Mark Morano, is one of the biggest climate deniers who is actively promoting that climate change is not real on Facebook. Facebook has said that they will 
stop news, fake news and climate change from spreading. But this person continues to spread misinformation. And this is one of his latest posts. It was, uh, you know, uh, a podcast which was shared a few days back. Uh, next. So uh, this means that, you know, the, the, the nexus of uh, social media and climate denial, this needs to be looked into. So World Economic Forum has outlined the top uh, long-term global risk where climate action failure, uh, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, natural resources crisis, uh, and human environmental damage are among the top long-term global risks, which means that, you know, for instance, Pakistan is witnessing very high level of desertification, which means that land which is, it, it is not productive anymore. And the climate action period is that, you know, we, we all know that, you know, uh, last year as well, Shisper Glacier, it damaged a bridge. And this year, it destroyed the bridge. Yeah. And the thing was that, you know, we've all been talking, the ministers have all been talking, nothing happened. The bridge was taken, and this is the secret truth, you know. So this means that how climate change has impacted our global global trade. So Chinese sixty-four billion dollar investment is at risk. Though they have said that they will replace by a week, and I hope they have already done that. But imagine that a global trade route is being affected due to a glacier which is surging and is experiencing glacial without this place. Next, so this is the climate risk index by. Uh, German Watch uh, 2021, which uh, according to which Pakistan is on the eighth position, losing $3.7 billion in the 20 year period and experiencing 173 extreme weather events. Next, temperature rise. Uh, here, the Met Office has said that April 2022 was the warmest month during the last 61 years, and March 2022 was the warmest month in the history of Pakistan. So, you know, there is one information that came up. The World Meteorological Organization said that this current heat wave spell is not climate change, but uh, there are other organizations that say that this is the result of climate change. So it is the job of climate journalists to figure this out, to find out the right answer. And I feel that, you know, this is the information that has to be communicated to climate, to climate journalists that, you know, uh, the course that you are going to, you know, uh, we win or you are going to prepare, it needs to have information on exact climate information, one, and then second, how to report it. If you are having information on how to report it, but you're lacking information on climate change, it means journalists won't be able to, the students won't be able to know how to address it. So we have to show them the, the full picture. Next. So this is a story I did. Uh, so how I did was that I just posted a tweet that can anyone help me with in assessing Lahore's urban forest cover? And uh, a person, a genius expert from Canada responded, his name is Shahid Baja. He said, yes, one more. And he did this brilliant imagery for me that in 2007, the urban forest cover was 12,359 hectares. 2010, the center picture, the urban forest cover was 7,900 hectares. In 2015, the urban forest cover was 3,520 hectares. <laughs> so through imagery, I was able to show this and what happened. It has been shared numerous times on Facebook, Twitter, the last uh, PTI government also shared uh, this image on their social, uh, on their Twitter account, saying that Lahar's urban forest cover is getting reduced and we are experiencing pollution. So the thing is, you cannot do journalism all on your own. You cannot be a jack of all trades because you're not a GAS expert. So what you need to do is you need to find someone as passionate as you are and ask them to do some of the work and that will make things easier for you. Next. So my other story was for Islamabad because we see that the roads are expanding. So I did this story in 2019. Uh, its title is Islamabad yes. and it's really becoming the next point of order. So we did uh, you know, imagery from 1976 to 2016. <coughs> and here we can see in red that you know, uh, deforestation or tree felling has happened or the green spaces have been removed. So you know, the, on, on this story, I received some very good traction. It was published in Express Review. So here's the same thing that you know we come up with, we collaborate with people, like-minded people, and that helps to get uh, good traction and produce better stories. Next. So BBC has long been uh, accused of giving space to climate denials. So I once went to Macquarie University in London when I was uh, doing the Chief Achieving Scholarship, and I met a BBC person and I said that, you know, look, uh, there's an issue that you give space to climate denials, and he said, no, oh, no. And after uh, everything, and you know, he drank, a couple, you know, a couple of drinks, and he got tipsy. 
and he said that look uh, man you right that you know we do give space to private nurses so this is like an unlikely move but uh, they have actually you know said it uh, that climate change has been a difficult subject for the bbc and we get coverage of it uh, wrong too often if the science proves it we should report it which means that you don't have to give space to a climate denial so while teaching this course to young students we tell them that uh if there is a person who says that no climate change is not real it's just an it's act of god which mostly people say but being uh, you know researchers and scientists uh i feel that you know we have a responsibility to play and uh, it means that a person who is a climate denier should not be given space in your work if that person is given space in your work it means that you are actually you know uh, halting climate action and what will it eventually mean that you know someone will someone will notice that you know the kind of stuff you have done and someone will point it out and people will start ridiculing you and the story may even have to be taken down get published in john or international next so the guardian has also a good guidelines on reporting climate change they say you don't use climate change use climate emergency or the climate crisis and instead of climate skeptics you use climate deniers or climate denier you use you, uh, you use wildlife you don't use biodiversity to add seriousness to the challenge next week so this is the title of my lecture that it was climate change affecting lives and livelihoods in the rural region of pakistan it has one person that pertains to you next so you know the one was on how small it was getting impacted we don't know was how temperature rise is impacting glaciers the third was of climate impacts on food security and the last one was on the role of climate uh, how climate communication can play a role to advance climate adaptation and mitigation next so here i did survey with 15 journalists of new press club and the two of the questions are very important because they have been responded by experienced journalists associated with the press club you know, to get in affiliation uh, with the press club to become a member you need to have some years of experience only then you become a member so our climate change story is difficult to produce for journalists especially in the hindu kushan region means uh, those journalists from the northern region do they find uh, it difficult to produce climate stories almost over 90% said yes Uh, we okay. Can we move next? Okay. The other was that do you agree that the knowledge of climate change is mostly in English makes it difficult for the journalists to produce new stories? And uh, seven, almost seventy-five percent said yes, which means that all the IPCC reports, the MET reports, WWF reports, which are being produced, they are not able to understand. It. so the thing is when we start talking that you know let's have reports in urdu but the thing is that who will do it you know if the bibliography doesn't do it because it's not the zone requirement then you know someone has to take the bibliography bill if you write good stories you get paid for good work you know writers pay us $200 $250 so uh, third for days $250 so you know if you are doing more work you're getting more money so means that you need to do work you need to understand all the complexities and simplify them for your audience and this is most important that you know when when you are developing your courses you tell them that you know uh, ipcc reports even the summary for policy makers report would be tricky and tough, would be difficult for you to understand but that doesn't mean that you stop doing it what you do is you take out the easy part from the executive summary if there is any confusion you reach out to the, to the report authors you write them an email and they, they do respond i've had experiences when you send them an email and they respond in a day so you know everything is possible it all depends on your will and commitment next so i was previously uh, before working with ivi i was with the national center for integrated mode development in kathmandu nepal so last year i came to pakistan for the smooth training we had in collaboration with wbf colleagues in delhi rajasthan and we had two journalists from each district of hindustan in training them so you know the outcome uh, we came up with came up with was that you know they need to be more sensitized on environmental issues because you know uh, for a journalist from here to go to which is for glacier and report to cost approximately you know, 40000 rupees ticket you <coughs> spend another 40000 accommodation it's over 100000 rupees cost uh, so you know they are the custodians and parachute journalism needs to be discouraged so you know they need to be sensitized on environmental issues and they had a very strong interest on 
um, the use of social media and earning through YouTube, you know. So people, journalists like you know, Matthew Lajan, yeah, before uh, doing his work on YouTube, he was really surviving. And now he makes millions, millions because of his amazing following. You know? So once you are able to develop your, your repute and prestige on social media, you're able to earn good money. And you know, journalists, they need to be trained on the impacts of climate change on the region. And you know, we need to tell them about storytelling. You know, it's not just about uh, one person said this, another said this, another said this, and the story ends. This is not actual journalism. So, you know, to, be, to produce a good climate story, you need to understand journalism there. You need to go with the flow, you go with the narrative. For instance, uh, you know, I did one, uh, once I did a story on how cyclone, cyclone Bhola, uh, back in the 1970s, in East Pakistan, it uh, you know hundreds and thousands of people got killed. The West Pakistani government wasn't able to identify or understand the seriousness of the problem. Awami League, they uh, the, the the party at that time, they took advantage of the situation and they said that look, the people of West they are not even in favor of saving their lives, and that contributed to the fall of Dhaka. So the thing is, how an extreme weather event, which was not the result of climate change, it added to insurgency. Let it, it led to Pakistan's downfall. So, you know, we, we start with this, we develop a narrative that helps to get good traction. Thanks. So these are some of the pictures of the, 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 visit, the, the trip we had. And, uh, you know, one of the trainers was, was uh, not uh, satisfied with my approach of, uh, you know, documenting uh, views. Uh, you know, if someone has said it and you write it down and you publish it, that's not enough. I once published a story on uh, life under life under the shadow of a cool fire park plant. So I went to Sahiwal, Khadrabad, and I reported how it is impacting. So immediately, you know, they wrote a big tall letter to Don asking them to take down the story. And they said, and you know, uh, they were very cunning. So, you know, guys from some guys from China, they reached out to experts asking them to retract their statements so that if everyone retracts the statement. It means that there's an FIR on me, and there is no way of getting away from it because it's by the coal power plant, a $2 billion investment, national interest at stake, and whatsoever. So the deal was one person, he retracted the statement, but the other ones, they, they stood for it. So the, the one who retracted was, uh, I didn't document it like in writing, I just, he said, and I wrote it. So for good climate journalism, you need to follow all the principles of journalism as well. So, you know, whatever it is, you document it, body record, or you, you videotape it. Even if you, a person has given his consent, uh, but he may not be willing to, you know, uh, come up on camera. So, you just, you just audio record it for your own safety. Next. So, yes, we also need to tell the journalists that, you know, though there are less opportunities in Pakistan, you know, we need to, we need to look at because there's there are good opportunities, there's recognition, there's good money, and uh, this is here's me uh, receiving an international award in 2015 from Singapore Environment Council, and in 2019 as well I received another award from the same organization, and these two awards gave me immense recognition, and the benefit it was that wherever uh, I dropped my CV, I did get a response. The response rate gets you know manifold increase; it increases manifold. So it's the two cases, you know, uh, Raina is, uh, she received the region's best reporting board from Asia on climate change. She's currently the chairman of the wildlife management board. So, you know, she attended the Copenhagen summit because of this, this award and it paved way for her to write for international media. Next. And there's Ankita Anand, she's, uh, she's from India. She's the recipient of Lorenzo Natali Media Prize in 2015. It also gave her a lot of confidence as a freelancer and she was able to develop more connections after that. And the benefit it gave was that, you know, from, from this award onwards, all the work she did was collaborative and international, which means more money coming in. It all depends on how much effort you are willing to pay in your work, and it will eventually give results. That's all for us. Thank you very much, Mr. I am so impressed by all the resources that we are getting, uh, whether it's in terms of uh, web links or the ideas that you, you all can incorporate in your 
courses related to climate journalism. Thank you very much, Mr. Abubakar. And I as well earlier played on Sakib as well because you, you're sharing a treasure trove of resources which can be used by so many people and in turn facilitate students in becoming good climate journalists. So I would now, uh, Sakib, we have Dr. Lisbeth yes. presenting. Okay. So, Dr. Elizabeth, you will be presenting now. Uh, um, thank you so much. I was supposed to give an introduction uh, to the whole seminar too, which I don't intend to do now. I might uh, add some words uh, at a concluding session instead. Uh, but I'd like to say for myself that I consider myself not only a professor of journalism studies, but also a journalist. I have a uh, uh, attended three of the climate summits, the one in Durban and the one in Paris, where they agreed on the 1.5 degree target, and also the one uh, in Glasgow just a few months back. And I did that as a researcher, but also as a reporter. So I did actual journalism, for the record. Uh, what you see below my name and my institution here is the short version of the address to the Media Climate Network, uh, where I'm the co-chair together with a Finnish professor. And this is a network we started in 2008 with the members from uh, many countries across the globe, both in the global south and in the global north, and where we have at least some members present here, such as uh, Mr. Saqib from uh, this institution where you all are, or many of you are, and also Bufiz Rahman from the Dhaka University. So I'm very happy to be with you at last, and uh, I'm trying now to uh, work on these slides for myself, and I'll begin with a very salient comment from uh, no less than the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. By the way, the pictures that you see are pictures for, that I've taken in Glasgow. I'm not a great photographer, I'm still learning that. Well, he said just uh, a little bit more than a one month back, he said that uh, uh, there was a warning that the world is sleepwalking to climate catastrophe. Uh, and he said that due to the ongoing pandemic and the war in Ukraine and the lack of political willpower, uh, this undermines humanity's efforts to slow down the warming of the planet. So he put it all in context and he said there is no kind way to put it. And I think the previous speakers have also addressed this. So uh, as I've been to these climate summits, for example, I've been able to uh, study at close hold the actors on the climate scene. Uh, such as the scientists. I have interviewed several of them for a book which came out in 2017, several of the top uh, climate scientists. And I think they do what they can, but they don't possess the language to speak to all kinds of people. So they need journalists to help them there, that's for sure. Politicians, they negotiate and uh, they sometimes promise and promises are not always kept, which has also, I understand, addressed by previous speakers. Journalists publish, but they publish too little and perhaps also sometimes too late about the problems uh, inherited by the climate crisis that we see now. And also, I think there is, uh, uh, I'm not arrogant when I say this because it's not only for uh, Pakistan or India or uh, Spain, it's Norway as well. Uh, there is too little climate literacy among journalists and this we need to repair. Businesses uh, sometimes do very prominent green things but they also are about greenwashing, which means they're just amending the surface of their doings and not really changing. Many of the NGOs, activists and youth, we have seen from 2018 the youth protests gaining ground. And we have documented much of this on our website, The Media Climate, since we have interviewed youth leading activists from uh, 23 countries across the world. They do protest and they also educate others as the Pakistani um, activists have done, uh, running courses for other youth, which is very interesting feature to see that the youth uh, who are the ones who are going to inherit the planet, they do things for themselves. They don't always rely on the previous generations. Ordinary people who in their daily lives have to adjust and adapt and also are pressurized into more mitigation. Uh, some of us may be partly sleepwalking, uh, partly doing our best. I think this is human nature also but we need to do more. Academics, do we care enough? I'm not sure, I don't think so. Then there should have been more programs, both cross-disciplinary and inside every discipline there is to really see that the coming generations of students know how to deal with the climate crisis. 
And journalists and educators, yeah, I think they care a bit, not as much as possible, perhaps. There is a huge potential here. And this workshop is about investigating this potential in Pakistan, a country where I, for those who don't know it, spent two years of my life. So I've never spent any time as much in any other country but Norway. So the challenges of climate journalism, as I see it, it's first to uh, generate an understanding by, so to say, translate the complicated science into grassroots audiences. This is one of the ethics of journalists, I think. Another one is connecting climate science to people's livelihood. Scientists increasingly do so, and uh, rightly so, because they have uh, done so much research that they can surely now say and conclude that many of the uh, effects that we see of climate change, such as that we think we can attribute to climate change, it's now a scientific proof that we can, excessive rains, excessive, excessive uh, slides, uh, no, uh, landslides, and all these other effects. Uh, then there is the challenge of doom and gloom reporting. I think the Secretary General of the UN was close to doom and gloom in his statement. I think he's rather desperate because he doesn't see the necessary action. I think it's right to say, as a researcher has said before me, that the situation is alarming, but alarmism might lead to hopelessness. So we have, as journalists, sort of being in a leadership position when it makes, uh, when it takes creating other people's understanding, People need to, journalists, we may consider ourselves leading, and as leaders, we need to give some kind of hope. And giving hope we do by a genre which has grown the last few years, uh, called solution-oriented journalism, constructive journalism, and others. So we look not only at the challenges and the doom and gloom, we look at solutions. That also means confronting politicians armed with the knowledge that we need to have, while absorbed, not being absorbed by the political game that we very much see at display at the climate summits, where people are blaming each other in a blame game endlessly, and action is then perhaps not agreed upon as much as it should be. There is, of course, and I am the first to recognize that, a north-south divide when it comes to historic responsibility for the current crisis. The global north has omitted through a long time much more of the global green gases, um, the greenhouse gases than has uh, um, countries in the global south. But the countries such as China and India are catching up. And there is no way we cannot all take responsibility now. Although I think the global north should be more clever at accepting their historic responsibility and thus uh, give more funds to the Climate Adaption Fund. This has been a recurring issue at the climate summits. Then also to give priority to climate issues when they compete with other national crises. I know in Pakistan you had a political crisis now, and I don't blame you for reporting on that, of course. But sometimes some connections can be made between different issues, such as, for example, war. The war we see going on now with Russia invading Ukraine, of course, that has negative effects on the climate. And there are other uh, issues we also can connect to, I think. Uh, for example, uh, uh, increased climate change, uh, in increased climate changes uh, will lead also to social unrest for sure when the effects are strong. Last but not least, as you also can see from this picture, it's about giving voice. Uh, journalist ethics tell us to give voice to the voiceless, and uh, the inheritors of the planet are not often that much heard. So the young generations who might live till the end of the century, they need to have a strong voice in the media, in my opinion. So um, how can we achieve this? I think first uh, to access the climate science, also critically, of course, but uh, to do that with the, the help of other disciplines than journalism and media, cross-disciplinary endeavors are very important here. I've also for many years talked about how climate change, climate crisis, should be taught perhaps sometimes in a combination between journalists and teacher training. Because teachers who uh, address youngsters uh, from primary school onwards, they has, have also to have this knowledge and be able to teach some of the uh, connections between what these uh, young students live in their daily lives and the big science of climate change. So then there is the transnational perspective. And I'm very glad that uh, the previous speaker brought up the climate vulnerable countries such as Pakistan. Uh, last time I accessed the climate vulnerable forum, however, 
Pakistan was not a member. So perhaps there's a task for journalists here to challenge the Pakistani government, whatever it might be in the next month or year, to actually join the CVF, the Climate Vulnerable Forum. When I was in Paris, I followed that forum. I thought the perspectives there were the most interesting, and I did the same in Glasgow. And it was actually through the pressures of this Climate Vulnerable Forum in uh, Paris in 2015 that the 1.5 degree target was agreed upon. It would not have happened without their pressure, that is for sure. And I could see that close hand. And then, of course, again, we have to combine people's local experiences by listening to them, and we have to combine them when it's possible with the overall conclusions of climate science. There are some good news here also. Climate scientists connect to a larger degree now than before the climate science and the extreme weather. Heat waves, extreme rains, floods and landslides, wildfires, etc. And we see it here. I can remember from my childhood, there was snow every winter in Bergen, the city where I am now. Now it's rare. So that has to do with global warming. And there are many other. So talk to the old people. Talk to them about the changes that they have observed during their span of life. And the good news is also that the youth all over the world are not going to remain silent about climate crisis. They have started acting with school strikes and they have also an interest for attaining knowledge and also for teaching each other. I also observe, and this was also addressed by the previous speaker as far as I could hear, newslets, outlets in many countries now give increased priority to the, to the climate crisis. Also in my own country, Norway, to some extent, and particularly the public broadcasting does so. So the last few days, there's been a lot of uh, issues when it comes to climate crisis in, in media where I come from. And the good news is also that uh, during the uh, Environment Journalism Forum and uh, due, due to the uh, media climate and other many other carbon brief was mentioned, all these resources are available for free and you can uh, access them, you can use them in education, they're digital and they're physical in the shape of books, etc., etc. So what kind of modes of education can we choose from? I think there are various ways to go about it and I think we need to be pragmatic also which means that sometimes uh, perhaps the most feasible thing is to start with a small effort because the programs are full and there is uh, perhaps also some resistance from other colleagues who do not see as we do uh, the importance of this. Well, the smallest effort could be to have a climate day or some climate days at the UNIVS uh, where you rise, raise the consciousness of the students, you combine scientists, media researchers and experienced reporters as is being done in this forum. So that is a, a humble start, but it could be quite successful. A middle range uh, solution would be to integrate climate in courses on news and other reporting, feature stories, whatnot. And uh, that is not so hard. You could just give students different assignments, more assignments which have to do with climate change. And I'm sure that's happening in some institutions already. And we do that as well, where I come from, in international reporting, for example. The larger issue is, of course, to have separate credit courses in climate reporting. We have started that some years back. We had on BA level and we have on uh, the uh, master level. And uh, uh, Siad Sakib, who is the convener who has successfully gathered us, he has joined one of these courses in our institution, actually. And we continue to do so with increasing force and with increasing learning, of course. Uh, network building. I mean, among you who come from different universities, there could be a solid networks where you share your experiences and learn from each other. We don't have each of us to invent the same wheel. And last but not least, I thought it would be an idea perhaps to have, and perhaps that's also happening some places, uh, article competition, term paper competition with the subject of climate crisis. Um, and uh, that has, of course, to do with uh, bullet point number four, that students need to be encouraged to go on field visits. I remember from the time when I was a humble visitor at the Punjab University, this was another crisis. This, would off, this was after the earthquake in 2005. And students from Punjab University, they went into the field where the vulnerable people still lived in tents because they'd lost their houses. And they had an FM radio up there addressing the social and psychological issues of the students, now of the people who were hit by the earthquake. I think similar things can happen now, and I'm sure they're also to an extent happening. So that is also a way of learning from local expertise, both formal and lay expertise, and also 
in many countries, it's about, as you see from the, my picture from Dosco here, it's to remember the indigenous people's wisdom. So this is my last slide. The world does need to, oh, sorry. Uh, what happened now? Well, anyway, I can just say what I wanted to say. We need to uh, not go sleepwalking as the UN Secretary General warned about. We need to actually be very awake and alert and thus uh, profit from each other's uh, experiences and uh, be head on when it comes to new efforts, which we all might shoulder. And with that, I thank you for your patience and for listening still. And uh, I hope to hear from people from different universities about their plans and needs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lisbeth. Thank you so much. Now we move on to uh, the next academic perspective, which is going to be from Mr. Sakit Saleem. He's the Assistant Professor of Mass Communication at Edison College. He's a PhD scholar with research interest in climate journalism. He's attended an international exchange at Austrimet, which Dr. Elizabeth was also talking about just now. And he studied a specialized course on global warming in journalism. He has designed a climate journalism course, worked as an independent consultant with the UK charity Water Aid, which works yeah. with institutions and communities to provide climate resilient water facilities and services. And he's also a member of the Global Climate Media Network, uh, Media Climate Network. So over to you, Sakib. Assalamu alaikum and um, good evening, everybody. I'm Sayed Mohammed Saqib, Assistant Professor of Mass Communication at FCC. Um, so I'm going to speak about my experience of teaching climate journalism and what I did with my students and what can be done uh, while teaching climate journalism. So this is how I divided my course, theory versus practice. So in theory, the components that I think uh, should be included should, uh, are history, context, research, ethics, and critical thinking. I'm going to talk about all of these uh, components and aspects of theoretical side of the course in detail. So in history, I think it's very important to talk about the historical background of science and climate action, sustainable development goals, because we cannot expect our students to have a scientific background because not everybody sitting in our classroom will know the science of climate change. So it's very important that we uh, just give them a basic information, basic historical perspective about climate change, about the sustain sustainable development goals. And the 13th goal, which is specifically uh, talks about climate action. And then Kyoto Protocol, when everything started, the climate journalism debate and the climate activism, everything was basically when how it all started and the climate journalism perspective should also be given, the historical perspective, I mean. And then the next thing I think um, important is to talk about context, contextualizing <laughs> climate, because this is where, uh, as professors, our role is to basically um, link the global issue with local experiences of our students and the things that we see, we feel the heat wave and the things that we've been reading here and there on, on the newspaper. So I think um, making connections between global problems and people's everyday uh, issues is very important. And that will also help them, help our students contextualize the climate uh, stories when they will eventually write in the practical phase of the course. After context, then the next thing is research and resourcing. I think uh, the research is equally important and research includes the scientific research and also the research that has been done in the climate journalism area. Because uh, through this part of the course, we can actually inculcate the idea of research in this field of climate journalism. So our students may in future take climate journalism as, um, as a research area for their thesis for other research projects. And there are a lot of websites, I've um, enlisted a few, that is mediaclimate.net. This website provides uh, resources related to climate journalism, um, uh, climate journalism research for students and educators. There is climate literacy lab. So all the um, scientific information created by NASA and IPCC is simplified for understanding. Um, and this can be used um, as a good resource for educators and we can uh, use this in our uh, classes. And then there is another website. So I think a research part is very important. 
and then next i think ethics and critical thinking are the two important things when we talk about any of the courses in journalism and i think apart from journalism also critical thinking is very important and when it comes to ethics it's basically verifying and contextualizing complex scientific information avoid passing biased or inaccurate information understanding the language used in climate reporting basically um there have been a lot of style guides uh, devised by uh, guardian by a lot of other international forums so it's better that our students understand they do a, they do brainstorming because we do not want to have reports where students or the future journalists are just publishing the scientific information as it is because the masses will not understand that we want our masses to understand the scientific information in a layman language for that it's important that our students do the critical thinking they do a lot of brainstorming and then they follow the ethics that they do not change the meanings they do not um, send the inaccurate information to people but yes um, all the data sheets maps scientific information is understood well and then uh, the second part of the course that i think is very important is practice in practice i think uh, a lot of things can be done the few that i thought we should do and there were things that i included my in in my courses is students can be asked to produce several newspapers or magazine articles analyzing case studies on victims local environmental organizations attending speeches uh, speeches and seminars webinars by people involved in the environmental movements presenting visual climate stories because uh, i mean writing is a different thing but presenting visual stories is also very important so i think uh, the photojournalism aspect can also be incorporated in the courses when we teach climate journalism field activities and workshops there are a few websites this journalite uh, journalist resource climate visuals media public alliance all these uh, websites and a few other obviously are available for us where uh, there are a lot of toolkits are available educator resources are available collaborative opportunities for our students to collaborate with international journalists to basically um, write collaborative reports on different climate climatic issues so and there are a lot of tips on covering climate stories are available so i think all these resources can be used and i think this is how we can learn and then educate our students and so we can work together to take an action against mitigating the effect of climate change so this is all what i wanted to say thank you so much i was a little too fast because i want to give yeah, time to other people me. yes uh, thank you so much i'll hand this over to miss uh, rachel thank you sakhi thank you so much for your presentation now i have uh, mr mohammad daud khan who is a station manager at kufa radio a network Good of chicken. 10 community radio stations in kufa he writes on minorities women and climate change issues he has received climate change media partnership reporting fellowship on cop 26 glasgow climate summit 2021 over to you mr daud and he was here with us just about a month to go month to and a half yeah. ago at another training that we had and now we have it i think How he has been accepted at oxford to be yeah. attended yes and then another fellow in his uh, yeah. cap this is us over to you mr if, daud if you can ask him to share his presentation also can you share your yeah. presentation also so or should we do that yes i will share i will share oh, great great thank you in you know, um hello everyone thank you so much for uh, the amazing panelists from around the world and the amazing students at the fc college university uh, media center thank you so much i am really honored to be here with you to share some of my experience of uh, climate journalism and what like we are doing, uh, what we are doing here uh, in the field and especially um, uh, i am Uh, sorry to interrupt uh, i just wanted to ask you to start the slide share sorry to interrupt okay 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 i will uh, uh is my screen shared yes. you can see my yes. my screen yes, yes. max yes. mess your slides oh, oh, okay slide slide share slide share screen full screen full screen slide okay okay yes this one yeah thank you so uh, actually uh, uh, currently i am a, a a fellow at the oxford university climate journalism network and uh, you already introduced me so i will uh, stick to 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 the field so what's 
recently last week i have uh, uh, did a piece for the news on sunday one of the largest circulated newspaper in pakistan so uh, in which i have focused on the the, the, um, the impacts of climate change in the northwest pakistan especially in the khyber pakhtunkhwa and my special focus was the was the tribal district the seven tribal district they were recently uh, merged in khyber pakhtunkhwa how the dry spell have affected the the crops productivity in khyber pakhtunkhwa so so if you can google that that is the headline in the first uh, slide that it dry spells low yields so this is the headline that published by the news on sunday so actually the the climate change has lots of impacts in our lives so and uh, uh, dry weather and erratic weather pattern have affected crop uh, yields and impacted communities and, and and we have seen that in lahore karachi uh, uh, in gilgit baltistan and north khyber pakhtunkhwa and southern khyber pakhtunkhwa Uh, uh, the panelists already mentioned that that uh, the heat waves uh, and other thing, but but here in this story that uh, I have focused that how the dry spell has affected the communities and the crop productivity because in Pakistan rice and and wheat they are the staple crop and and we do lot of uh, bread here in Pakistan and some of other South Asian countries and rice as well. so these are the main crops for uh, for the people here in pakistan so so the climate change and these uh, erratic uh, weather pattern is also affecting uh, our uh, productivity especially the yield productivity recently we have seen that 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 the khyber pakhtunkhwa cabinet has announced that we will buy extra wheat uh, this year uh, due to the low yield uh, in the in the in the those area which are not uh, have a very good irrigation system and uh, they are the, the most of the unirrigated areas so so recently uh, the world bank uh, has also uh, released his report that uh, 260 million people could move within their countries due to slow onset climate change impacts by 2050 and and recently now we are observing these things in pakistan especially in in sindh province and and balochistan province and even in some districts of uh, uh, khyber pakhtunkhwa especially the merz district in mumun districts district mumun which has uh, bordering with with peshawar we have seen that some some community have been migrated due to the to the low uh, uh, due to the, the water scarcity in their area so they have moved to to shabkadar uh, one of the subdivision in district uh, charsadda so we are observing these things here uh, in khyber pakhtunkhwa as well so 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 the climate change are affecting our yield productivity our crops productivity and they are uh, impacting the, the 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 communities here in kp so so uh, another thing that people will migrate from area with low water availability and crop productivity yes in in in, in kp we are observing this that people are starting migrating due to the low availability of water because water shortage is a very serious issue right now i am sitting in in parachinar and uh, once we, when we visit to the parachinar city we can we can easily see Uh, a lot of water container uh, in the city so it is a very serious issue not only in parachinar and koram but in khyber uh, and mumun and bajawar as well these uh, the, these uh, uh, districts are uh, really really uh, need water and uh, we don't have especially the district administration and the kp government and the federal government don't have such an outstanding uh, project to 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 overcome this serious threats uh while while when i was uh, collecting the data and and speaking to 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 the the expert uh, for this story so dr asif khan is uh, is also as a phd from the oxford university and he is a climate change and water uh, expert in kb and uh, he told me that uh, right now we are facing heat waves but 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 in the coming years the duration and the intensity of these heat waves should be increased to four times like we have uh, a few heat waves this year but in the next year we can we will we will face uh, a double and and the next year triple and 
it will increase four times with the passage of time and it will it will have impacts it will affect humans as well uh, it will cause deaths and it will affects our crop productivity and and it will affects our fruits and and farms and garden as well so so he is an expert and he shared this uh, this opinion and and actually uh, uh, food cluster uh, food security cluster report it is an international organization who is actually uh, focusing on uh, Uh, food security around the world and recently they have published uh, a report that nine rural districts of balochistan and seven rural districts of khyber pakhtunkhwa and nine rural districts of sind that house around 8.6% uh, of pakistan population so so they will face uh, food insecurity uh, this is a very alarming uh, uh, report and, and 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 recently the khyber pakhtunkhwa and the balochistan and and sin uh, province they have uh, they have also acknowledged this report and they also share uh, some more data to 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 the journalists that some of the the uh, districts in khyber pakhtunkhwa they are uh, really really hit by by climate change and one of them is upper chatral they are facing uh, uh, floods and and Uh, actually glacier melting and one of the panels already said that even even in gb what we have seen two weeks back in khumza actually the sin government uh, recently uh, the cm the cm uh, has uh, also declared that the seven district as calamity head district so these these are are are, are the threats uh, that that what we have been observing here in pakistan and uh, that what our government and and the provincial governments and the, the federal government are 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 uh, telling us and and that that what the media is reporting about the climate change and its effect uh, in 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 khyber pakhtunkhwa and other parts of uh, balochistan sindh and uh, uh, kp here so so climate change is a reality they are affecting us and and the journalists need to to investigate such kind of story with with the data and uh, uh, with, with 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 some connect the 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 science uh, with with the human being so that what we are doing we are connecting uh, the human stories with the latest scientific research on the climate change so thank you so much i think i have uh, Uh, 10 minutes for for this thank you so, ji thank you so much dao thank you it's nice having you with us today thanks a lot now we have uh, stella paul who is the project manager for clean air catalyst and stop spill over at earth journalism network a multimedia journalist trainer and a communicator for over a decade Uh, she is reported from over 30 countries around the world and has trained over 500 women journalists and activist bloggers worldwide she has won the uh, won the courage in journalism award from the international women's media foundation and the global trail blazers award from the european commission uh, she has been awarded one of the 14 most powerful writers on women and girls health and rights by women to deliver the 2014 her interests include exploring cultures and networking with community leaders from various countries over to you stella thank you thank you everyone sabse pehle to main ye kehti hu ki main india mein hu i am based in hyderabad india to hamare beech ki jo hai communalities bahut zyada hai we have shared experiences and uh, i think one of uh, i'm one of the last speakers so my presentation is going to be really short just a few uh slides and uh, before i play them for you i wanted to quickly thank uh mohammad sakib uh to to for this opportunity and uh it was also great to see some old faces uh mohammad daud khan and uh, abu bakar whom i had met i think uh, three years ago in singapore once um so yeah thank you for this opportunity it's not uh very often that we get to 
uh, have this kind of, uh, you know, be part of this kind of um, uh, events where journalists and uh, climate uh, and uh, environmental journalism educators come together. Uh, which is actually something that we should be doing more often. So do uh, thank you very much for excellent presentations uh, and, and of course, great moderation. I've been really enjoying uh, every single presentation. So with that, let me uh, share my screens. Uh, do let me know if you can see them well. Um, okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. So uh, uh, today my, my topic is uh, something that is very close to my heart. Um, I, as a journalist, I identify myself as somebody who tells the stories of climate change and environment through a gender lens. And uh, this is uh, what I'm also going to say. Uh, so the first thing is, why gender? So, because this needs to be, you know, I have only have a few minutes and I don't want to overshoot my time. So I have just picked, there are so many <laughs> reasons to do, uh, it, it talk about gender uh, in the context of environmental journalism, but I have just picked three big reasons. The first one, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, to tell the missing stories. So as journalists, we are storytellers. We are also the bridge between uh, people who are on the front line of, uh, of environmental uh, degradation, climate change, uh, and what have you. And, and on the, so people who don't really, who are actually facing it, but they are not uh, necessarily making a decision to, to, on that or, or don't have the power to, to shift things or change things. And then on the other side, we have the authority, we have policymakers, and those uh, who have the, you know, have access to, to all the tools and resources to make a decision or change things. So what are the missing stories uh, as journalists that we think, I think are, are still there that, um, you know, we are not really telling the stories. It's not that we don't really look at, we don't, we are not, necessarily not aware of gender. We don't think that, you know, we are, we are intentionally cutting off one gender from the story and focusing on the other. A lot of times it is that we are consciously not making an effort to include gender in our stories or to think about stories. I mean, sometimes theoretically, I was hearing uh, Mamad Sakib talking about that is the theory part. And then there is the, you know, the, the, pragmatic but I'm telling the story part you know how does it actually unfold on the ground we journalists do this bridging actually we we do go back to scientists we go to the data experts we bring in we talk to the policymakers but then we also put a, a, a human face into it a face of a, of a person in that and and when it comes to that what we need is breaking down the theories and the big data into into stories, exact story ideas. And this is where most of the journalists, they fail to mainstream, to bring in gender. So what I have done here is, if you can see, I've just uh, mentioned a few examples. For example, we are telling the stories of environmental degradation. Uh, right now, my colleague, uh, Hannah, uh, was, was on Mentimeter and many of you gave some excellent inputs, uh, heat wave, uh, smog, pollution, uh, temperature increase, flood, and so many other things that you feel strongly about. Okay, so obviously environmental degradation is 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 uh, is one of the topics that you think so often. But how many of us do we actually uh, consciously think about how these environmental issues have impact? different impact on different genders. That is something that often goes missing in the, our stories. For example, sexual and reproductive health. So the effect of environmental degradation, whether that is water scarcity, whether that is heat wave, whether that is flood and so on, you know, or smog or pollution, air pollution, 
you know, what, what, well, how do different genders, you know, face these challenges and how does it actually affect their well-being, their lives? Sanitation and hygiene. Bohot, bohot kam sunne ko milta hai is tarah ki story jahan pe ki hume pata chalta. We, we talk a lot about plastic pollution. We talk a lot about uh, water scarcity uh, faced by families. But how many times do we consciously report on how menstruating women and girls actually manage to, you know, uh, ma manage when there is water scarcity? How often do we talk about the, the burden of, uh, you know, uh, or the contribution of um, plastic pollution, uh, contribution of, uh, to, to plastic pollution by uh, discarded sanitary napkins? Or how often do we talk about the lack of proper sanitation? Uh, let's say uh, the you know proper, uh, as I said, um, uh, sanitary napkin, uh, you know, disposal system. Uh, these are things that are sometimes because of our our social context, most of uh, or our structure. Many of times they are actually taboo, and we do not make a conscious effort to break this taboo. Um, Greater risk of contamination. We know that women, they, talk, they take care of their uh, children. And therefore, in many cases, they are often, you know, if, if children are playing with these days, COVID-19 or other zoonotic uh, diseases, you know, they often bring women uh, because, um, you know, they, they, they are, they put all those people who are having direct exposure to wildlife species, whether that's bat or that's rat and so on. So women who actually take care of their children are also often going outside of their houses and they end up sharing the disease burden of their children as well. So if a child gets sick, it comes back to the mother and vice versa. Um, division of labor, you know, and the risks that it puts. Um, one small example, maybe many of you can identify with this. If we go into the tribal fields, we will see that many of, most of the indigenous women, it's their job to go into the jungle and collect fodder, grass. You know, this is, this is a job. This is a, this is a clear division of labor and women do it, you know, and, 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 this puts them at direct risk, you know, exposes them to wildlife. Uh, and many a times uh, in the, if you, uh, in the Himalayan sector uh, of, uh, you know, especially in India, we have seen hundreds of women have been attacked by leopards and other animals because they had gone into the forest to collect fodder. This happens, but this just doesn't get covered enough in the media. We don't do it. Then there is intersectional vulnerabilities uh, and invasive species and livelihood risks. Let's say women who are from, in, especially in the uh, uh, in the indigenous communities, women <coughs> who have to go, they do hunting gathering, uh, they have to collect roots, they have to collect, you know, minor forest produces. When they go into the forest, they find that there are in invasive species, which is a biodiversity uh, topic, big topic. And because of that, the product, the forest producers have decreased, which means that women, are, they, they come back home with less uh, forest produce, with less food, which means, you know, uh, risking their, their, their livelihood. Uh, intersectional vulnerabilities, again, women, especially from, uh, let's say, indigenous and marginalized communities. Uh, you know, so their ownership to land, uh, the sh shrinking uh, amount of, shrinking volume of land or lack of land ownership, then leading them to, to, to poverty and also migration. These are certain things that happen, but we don't really, take at least not a holistic approach or we don't really break these things down into, uh, into, into news. When we something big happens, uh, some, some a woman was badly attacked, badly injured, she, she uh, went to the hospital, yeah, we do, uh, let's say, small para uh, breaking news. 
that's that's almost about it. We don't go deeper into the stories. We don't make a conscious effort. I think that is a big reason why the stories remain missing. And as journalists, storytellers, it is our duty to see that the stories are no longer untold. The second one uh, here is getting the full story. So one is the missing story. The whole story jo report hoti nahi hai. Hoti hai to thodi si hoti hai ya fir gaib ho jati hai. The second story is the gendered impact of climate change. You know, these stories are, you know, sometimes they are, they, they, they are usually reported in an incomplete manner. So let's say disaster risk, let's say flood. There was a big flood. It took so many X, Y, Z people died and these many lives, these many X, Y, Z villages were affected, you know, and whether they received the insurance or whether they received the government aid in time or not. What we don't look at is how are different genders, men and women and girls and little boys, how are they being affected by these disasters? Many of us who have been reporting from the ground, especially in South Asia, we know that one thing that almost always happens after every big disaster is that human trafficking. Children are extremely vulnerable. Women are very vulnerable. They, 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 they get sexually abused. They get sexually uh, they, uh, you know, uh, impacted. They get violated and they get exploited. Uh, if you, uh, I was, I reported on the big uh, earthquake in Nepal, which happened in 2015. And one year after that, when I went back uh, to do a follow-up story, I found that several women from one of those villages where I had reported were actually missing. Where those women, they all went up into, they all ended up in Gulf countries as mates, but we don't really know. You know, where are they now and where, wh whether they are still earning there because their families have not heard back from them in last two, three years. So these are trails of things, trails of impacts that, uh, you know, uh, remain there for us. So what we do is that we do a breaking story again around a breaking story, but we don't do follow up stories. And therefore, the story kind of remains in parts, bits and parts. We don't get to tell the whole story. Security and safety risk, as I mentioned, in many cases, while I was uh, covering uh, the uh, cyclone uh, storms on Sri Lankan coast and in Indian coast, uh, I have seen that many women actually reported being molested right in the cyclone shelter. Why? Because these cyclone shelters are not uh, made, you know, designed in a way where women have their own space. So men, women all ha are huddled together. And that's when some people, at least a section of people, end up exploiting uh, the, uh, the women and girls, uh, you know, <coughs> physically and sexually. And then, of course, there is this big issue of uh, trafficking, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and all this. Next is physical violence and mental violence. Whenever there is climate stress, whenever there is a especially a farming family that loses its crop, that loses its livelihood. You know, it uh, creates stress more in men and women. And I'm not saying that physical violence is faced only by women uh, even or mental violence is faced only by women. Uh, let's say a man, he takes to drinking, heavy drinking. Okay, and then because it's a social stigma and social taboo to seek support for mental uh, disease or mental sickness, especially in South Asia, uh, mental disorder is still, uh, you know, it's, it's like a metaphor we use for somebody, uh, you know, who is, uh, who, is, who is mentally unstable. So a person who is having stress, doesn't seek, uh, you know, uh, experts help, ends up beating his wife, so wife beating, uh, resorting to drinking, taking debts, getting trapped into debt, you know, debts. All of these are different forms of violence that we don't really make, they, they don't really uh, come into the, into the main picture where we are reporting about disasters. 
So we need to we need to get the full story, not not just cut it into parts and 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 and, and uh, serve that. The third thing is changing the narrative. So this is a picture. Actually, it was a very nice story uh, I read on NPR. And these two sisters, I believe, uh, they uh, they what they have done is they have started planting stories, uh, planting uh, trees. Um, so this is symbolic of the story that you know ex that 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 you know as a, a narrative that is not very common. In most cases, if you you will see that women are usually portrayed as victims of disaster, as victims of climate change or uh, environmental degradation. So something bad happens. Usually the our, our you know the photojournalist or you know go and take the picture of a woman uh, because probably it connects with the audience better or maybe it's available. Uh, I don't know, but yeah, what we don't see too many stories is where the woman is actually portrayed as a climate leader or in leading an environmental initiative or doing you know scripting a success story. There are so many such stories at the community level, at the village level, at the you know, in, in the district level. But we either we sometimes do one or two interviews with somebody, you know, some uh, government official. Uh, but otherwise, you know, we we rarely do this in a consistent uh, way. So the narrative that comes in front of us is that man does this something constructive. Women is the usually the victim. Climate action by women. Again, the same thing. There are so many women's groups there that, that, that are actually doing very constructive, successful, leading some successful community. By the way, when we say successful community action or climate action, doesn't necessarily mean planting some trees. If there, there are women who are probably working in a bank, in the banking sector or in the finance sector, and if they are helping, you know, expedite a file on uh, a climate project, because this is a big issue where women's groups usually don't get access to climate finances because they don't have the capacity or because the bureaucratic process is too slow. So if there are women who are actually trying to change this, that itself is, a, is an example of climate leadership, which we normally don't write about. Environmental solutions by women, whether that is, you know, eco-friendly sanitary napkin or whether that is, uh, you know, you know, uh, just, just designing something, whether that it may be as simple as designing uh, cane baskets that will help stop food loss and food damage in the super in, in the village level for, for uh, you know, small farmers and women as decision makers. These are things that are usually, again, the narrative is exactly opposite. Usually we see a very one dimensional narrative where the, a successful leader brings the image of a man and not a woman. And when we think about something bad happening, we usually think of a small child and we think about a woman. We don't always consciously think about a different picture than this. So we need to change this narrative. And now, uh, uh, Hannah earlier told you uh, some of the things that we do uh, in our different initiatives, the fellowships, grants, and so on. Um, so I just wanted to say, like, you know, I've just talked about gender, and I just said that gender mainstreaming is really important. To be honest, gender mainstreaming actually it, it was fairly uh, it, it's, it's a new thing. Even the UN, at the UN level, it took them years and years and many, many, many cops to actually accept a gender uh, action plan. In UNFCCC itself, a gender action plan wasn't uh, adopted until 2017. So you can understand that why talking about gender is so important because things are so slow. Things are still... Mm -hmm far, far behind of where we should be. Um, so what, what are we doing at EJN? So first of all, at EJN, we have now a general working group. And of course, uh, in the, our, our uh, 
Greater Inter News Organization. We have a lot of work being done on uh, around gender, but at EJN, in simple terms, what we do is we give grants and fellows. Uh, Hannah just told you that we have different kind of story grants and fellowships. So when we are, we all do judging of the applications. When we receive applications, we do a conscious uh, effort uh, to see that at least we are selecting 50% of women fellows or 50% of women applicants to for these grants. The second thing is sometimes, of course, that's a challenge because we don't really receive a lot of women uh, application from, from both genders. Sometimes we have too many applications from women and we are missing out on the application from men. And sometimes we have too many applications from men, but not too many from women. Um, but we are trying to, to, to stay, you know, as make it as gender balanced as possible. Mentorship focused on making journalists grantees gender aware so that our, our uh, you know, we give mentorship when we select a grantee or we select a fellow, we also provide training and mentorship. And during our mentorship, we make an effort to see that our mentor is making the story gender sensitive in very practical terms. It means interviewing both male and female experts, interviewing, uh, you know, men and women in the community and so on. Excuse yeah. Me. So, sorry to cut you. Uh, can you please wrap up because the time limit is... I am. This is pretty okay. much my, my last... Okay, okay. <laughs> I timed it right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And the third thing is, of course, conducting studies and producing reports. So, this is the other thing that we do. We, we also conduct studies and we produce reports to highlight the gender gaps that remain in especially in different regions we have this is the link to uh, the latest report that we have produced uh, and it also has a good picture from Pakistan that highlights you know where uh, the you know women in media uh, in Pakistan are stand you know do stand and what do they miss and what do they need um, so yeah that's that's it thank you uh, and uh, let's keep the conversation going. Um, I, I thank you again for the opportunity and look forward to connecting with you all again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. Thanks a lot for your presentation. It was really very enlightening. And now I would like to move the virtual mic yeah, to Dr. Elizabeth and Ms. Una Solberg. Let me stop sharing my... Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Una, can you? Yes. Uh, and I would just like to encourage the people, since we have no time for debate, uh, due to uh, some of us taking too much time, uh, no blame here, but um, could you post comments and questions in the chat while we do the closing session? That would be great. Thank you. I'll come back after Una. So I should start or we wait for some questions? Yeah, please. Yes, please start. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think uh, this was a great day. And actually, this uh, week is important for the environment and for climate uh, globally, hopefully. Uh, Sunday, uh, 5th of May, <clears throat> is the World Environment Day. Uh, only one Earth is the headline. And this week, uh, a lot of world leaders are meeting in Sweden, uh, 50 years after the first conference on climate. Uh, 100 countries are represented uh, at Stockholm plus 50, as it's called. Also, youth uh, climate activists like uh, Greta Thunberg, I'm sure you've heard of her, and Fridays for Future will be there. Uh, but they're not very optimistic, they're saying to Swedish media. There is nothing to celebrate. Uh, even the politicians agree that too little has been done these last 50 years. So um, the time to act is really now for all of us. I, I wanted to thank you all for joining this uh, workshop on climate journalism education. We are very proud to work with Foreman Christian College University Media Climate Net, Earth Journalism Network, and other scientists and journalists all over the world. We hope that this can lead to further cooperation. 
So again, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, Climate Journalism is Climate Action Workshop. I know that you are suffering from the heat in Pakistan these days. So we know that climate change has become real, uh, is concrete and part of every day's life. Uh, we are giving this priority and you can find news and resources on our homepage. If you search Oslomet and Jamie, you will find it. And uh, this is the website that Elizabeth mentioned, climatenet dot cli cli media climate sorry uh, dot net. So uh, please stay in touch uh, and uh, let us help each other to work against the climate change. We will have to continue searching for good solutions to meet all the challenges uh, for our environment in the time to come. So I want to thank you all very much for coming. Elizabeth? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to stress one particular feature of this workshop also, and that is the regionality. Um, we uh, have people here from uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Now, uh, finally, Mufiz Rahman came up at, with a picture. Nice to see you, Mufiz who uh, used to be a PhD student with a program we had at Bergen University, actually, and a very successful one at that. We also have uh, Chitam Sharma here from uh, India. Very nice to see you as well, together with Stella Paul, of course. And uh, we know also that there has been no lack of um, problems and conflicts between these three countries. And I happen to love all these countries, in addition to Afghanistan. So I am a peacemonger among them, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Uh, the concept of missing stories, I think, is important. It was mentioned here. And I think we could say also that um, there is one big story that might change for the positive if it is made. And the big story is to really alert people to what's going on and alert the politicians, the decision makers, the businesses, and make them all understand that this, actually, the climate crisis that we are facing now, is the story of the survival of the planet and the survival of the next generations, at least the survival in a decent manner. It's already quite a few people, quite a few millions who are living in degrading conditions caused by the climate change. There are success stories, and I think the 1.5 degree target was a success for it, brought about uh, by the Climate Vulnerable Nations, as I mentioned, the Climate Vulnerable Forum. I think uh, that was a global success story. There are local ones. I traveled in India in the early 1990s, and I was witnessing then how uh, the Indian farmers and scientists together had uh, invented biogas systems, which used both animal waste and indeed also human waste to create energy. This is a success story locally, but it has spread to many places, actually. I've seen also in India stories where people have uh, protected the uh, regions of indigenous people against exploration which might harm the climate. And that brings me to another very important issue, which is how you work with environment, the survival of species and climate change, climate crisis together. I think that is another very, very important connection that people need to make. In some areas in Pakistan, they worship nature. Uh, some people in uh, uh, valleys, uh, which are very close to Afghanistan in the north, in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Um, there is a tribe or some tribes uh, which worship nature, perhaps more than other gods. And uh, I think um, we should all, irrespective of what religion we might adhere to, worship nature, because to worship nature means to care. And I think there is such a lack of care in many places, and uh, we should change that. But most of all, it's about amending the problem of the missing stories by way of education, by way of training journalists, also short-term training, couldn't only be within the academic world, could be other places as well. But I think around the table that I can see and among the people who have attended digitally, uh, I see a big potential of changing this. So I thank you very much for attending and for bringing all these different perspectives from the excellent speakers. And I would really love to see you again. Uh, we have already talked about having a larger conference in the autumn, a physical one in Pakistan, perhaps also with 
people from other regional districts, countries. Re yeah, here and there. Thank you again, and thanks for the uh, patience that I had to <laughs> make you endure. But um, now I think my computer is in the right way. So have a nice evening. Thank you, Dr. Lisbeth and Ms. Una. Thank you very much. Uh, the participants here have for, uh, filled the evaluation forms and the online participants, we will be, Mr. Saki will be sending you the evaluation forms for you to fill. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to thank the panelists, Dr. Dirk Bakker, Dr. Lisbeth, Hannah Bernstein, Mr. Abu Bakr, Mr. Sake, Mr. Dao Khan, and Ms. Stella for your discussion for a very, very enlightening and an interesting uh, talk on various aspects of climate journalism, how we can incorporate that into our uh, academic discourse, into our courses, and how we can further engage in more collaborations, whether it is uh, with regards to courses or research in, in every and any aspect that we possibly can. So thank you all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to say goodbye to our Zoom participants <laughs> because we have a certificate ceremony here and the online certificates will be sent to, to the online participants uh, later on. Right. Thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you for, for all that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Dr. Saki. Thank you. Thank you.